You're listening to the Psychedelic Invest Podcast, where we speak with founders, CEOs, investors, advisors, experts, and thought leaders in the brave new world of psychedelics and entheogenic medicines. Brought to you by Psychedelic Invest, bringing you unparalleled psychedelic investing data and analysis. Psychedelic Invest is the industry's leading resource for those looking to invest in the burgeoning psychedelic industry. For more information and to access all of the podcast episodes, check out our website at psychedelicinvest.com slash podcast. And now here's the host of the Psychedelic Invest podcast, Bruce Eckfeld. Welcome, everyone. This is the Psychedelic Invest podcast. I'm Bruce Eckfeld. I'm your host. Our guest today is Tim Schlitt. He is co-founder and partner at Palo Santo. We're going to talk about the world of psychedelics and where we are as an industry, where we are with some of these businesses, kind of take a look from an investment point of view, what's going on in that market. Obviously, a pretty dynamic, growing area, a lot of kind of changes and evolution going on and, you know, hopefully get a sense of where are we at that and, and kind of where we're going. You know, a lot of different angles that we can take psychedelics and uh, kind of figuring out what that market looks like, what the what's going on in the horizon and where we might be going is uh, always an interesting conversation for me. So, and Tim has been doing this for a little while and, and has some good insights. So excited for this. With that, Tim, welcome to the program. Great to be with you, Bruce. Yeah, pleasure. Before we dig into, you know, what's going on in the psychedelics today and what you're seeing in the market, let's do a little background. What's the story? Like, how do you get into the investing? How do you get into psychedelics? Uh, give us the journey you've been on. Yeah, the full Genesis story. It is, yeah. it is sadly not that someone just laced my coffee one day with LSD <laughs> and had like a, a breakthrough experience. I, I wish it was that that sexy, but a little less exciting than that. It, it started in investment banking and then private equity I have been in the healthcare field throughout my career, you know, focused on M&A advisory services and then later private equity investing, but mm -hmm. started in life sciences, move over to healthcare services during my private equity investing stint, but I've been in healthcare throughout, you know, throughout all of it. And I think that's had a lot of bearing in how we view and vet psychedelic opportunities since the direction we're seeing a lot of this space heading is really that more medicalized type pathway. So getting FDA approved medications that will be prescribed by doctors and the type of business and the profile and the revenue or lack thereof generating profile of businesses is quite different. Um, and so requires a very different vetting process. But with that said, I've always had a passion for mental health throughout my whole life. And it was about four years ago is I started seeing a lot of the really compelling data coming out of Johns Hopkins, NYU, Imperial College London, you name it, when holy crap, this is really, really interesting. I mean, when you're in the life sciences space, there's animal models, and then there's human mm -hmm. models and clinical models. And once you're in the clinic, and in humans, that's when it gets really interesting. And so just looking at the early efficacy rates, it was like, wow, why aren't we at least talking about this and having a conversation? It was still at a time where it was heavily stigmatized. So kept digging, kept networking, met a ton of folks in the field, and was waiting for that right opportunity to launch something like Palo Santo or get involved. And between me and my business partner, Daniel Goldberg, and then later Tony Eisenberg, Zach Lomas, as well, we all realized COVID was really that catalyst where the next wave after the COVID pandemic would be a mental health pandemic. Mm -hmm. And we thought a renewed spotlight was definitely going to be shined on a lot of these medications since the current suite of offerings out there, the current standard of care is very lacking in a lot of ways. So Launch Palo Santo have raised 45 million to date. We've been really active in the space. We've deployed 18 million already into the ecosystem mm -hmm. um, and have a great team and great team of scientific advisors that we've brought along along the way between Chuck Nichols, Julie Holland, David Sherman, John Graydon, Gretchen Tamalis, you name it, all rock stars and experts in their field across IP, pharmacology, medicinal chemistry, psychiatry, all the above. So it's been really exciting and really cool to be paving the way in this ecosystem. Yeah. I'm curious, given that you're coming out of, you know, traditional kind of biotech, pharma, kind of drug development models, like how, like how is this kind of normal and not normal when it comes to how this process typically works, right? How, how early stage companies find opportunities, develop new um, compounds, do new therapeutic models, test them, validate them, bring them to market. Like where is this kind of following sort of a normal course and where is this not following a normal course? Yeah. In terms of normal course, I mean, all drugs, be they psychedelic, non-psychedelic, have to go through an FDA 
preclinical process and, and pre-IND process in particular, mm -hmm. and then assuming animal models validate enough aspects of that drug in particular around the, the toxicity profile that there really there's little to none of that or it's manageable, then they'll go into humans in the clinic and there's stages of clinical trials from phase one safety studies all the way through phase two, phase three efficacy studies. So that is all standard, just mm -hmm. like any, whether it be what antidepressants went through, even the COVID vaccine, you name it, they went through these series of clinical trials and stepping up sample population sizes and, and vetting these compounds. And one aside to that, what we really like about that model is it's actually a great Trojan horse way to get a drug de facto legalized. So the DEA defers to the FDA on these matters. And if you find a medical use case, the DEA, by, you know, by definition, no longer can count it as Schedule 1. And there's actually a lot of precedent around this, whether it's Marinol, Zyrem, Syndros, Epidiolex, a lot of drugs that had been previously scheduled, um, mm -hmm. but got FDA approval and got rescheduled and could be prescribed by doctors. Where these are unusual is two, two things. One, I would say the fact that for a lot of the first-gen compounds, psychotherapy is getting paired with the delivery of the drug. I don't yeah. really know of any precedent where you're having an element of talk therapy or psychotherapy and a protocol there in tandem with the delivery and, and that's so critical to even clinical trial success with these. But you can't really patent psychotherapeutic protocols. So yeah. it's interesting. It's so critical, but not patentable. And there's there's debates of does that create a moat around businesses. The other one, which is I'd say in between around whether it's normal or abnormal, would be most of these first line therapies, at least in the case where it's psychoactive, will have what's known as a REM strategy wrapped around it. So that's risk evaluation and mitigation. Mm -hmm. And that's just when you have a black box warning or some risks around it, the drug. The FDA is going to require some protocols or a database. In many cases, that's what we saw with thalidomide when Zy when um, when Celgene advanced that compound and also Zyrem advanced by Jazz Pharma. So we'll certainly see a REMS protocol and strategy with a lot of these drugs. There, there have been cases of that in pharma, but that is less frequent compared to most drugs that hit the market. A lot of drugs, as we know, don't have this psychoactive profile, yeah. so don't require that. So given that we kind of have these two parts to the solution, we've got these compounds that are following traditional drug models. We've got the psychotherapy, talk therapy that need to be coupled with them. How do you see the market being structured in terms of, do you see different companies handling different parts of this? Are companies putting this together? Where do you see the solutions kind of being developed? I understand what you're getting at. Yeah. I mean, I think well, one interesting thing around the psychotherapeutic protocols is that's really, that's not something big pharma is used to developing. So it's again, very interesting that it's so critical to the rollout, at least of gen one with psychedelics. Now, one company we are invested in is called Fluence and they are, they play a really active role around training therapists designing the protocols around these medications, helping out with the clinical trials, and then also helping out with the scale up of clinicians once these commercialize. So I do think that will be a service that definitely gets outsourced to specialists um, who are, are, are specialized in training. I mean, when you think about medical billing and coding, that's not something that you know, someone advances a therapy, they don't go through the whole process of teaching medical billers and coders about their CPT codes. No. That's something that gets outsourced to training programs and folks that do continuing education around that. So I certainly see a bit of that. Now, one thing just to add to your comment, I think where we'll see the space bifurcate is this Gen 1, there's definitely going to be commensurate psychoactivity. You'll have a psychotherapeutic protocol. You are seeing this push towards a Gen 2 or Gen 3 where there's questions around, you know, could you have a psychedelic with without really psychoactivity? There's also a debate on, you know, is this mystical experience, does that just correlate with a certain peak mm. occupancy of receptors of especially the 5-HT2A receptor? Yep. And, you know, what we characterize as this subjective mystical experience is really at its root a pharmacological phenomenon, or do you need that surface area, as some people would characterize it as, of this big, you know, broad experience where you can psychologically process it. Yep. I'd say we don't really know. I mean, the focus so far has definitely been on the psychoactivity. I think it's come out of the Roland Griffiths, Bill Richards type model where you need a big breakthrough mystical experience. Mm -hmm. But I will say, as you talk to the pharmacologists, there's so little we still understand around the underlying pharmacology of these substances that the jury's still out in a lot of yeah. ways on, on where we could get to over the next 10 or 20 years of drug discovery in this yeah. space. And where do you see this being applied? I mean, there's been various kind of anecdotal 
kind of connections to, you know, using these, these compounds, these experiences to kind of help people, everything from kind of process trauma to deal with mental health issues, PTSD, addiction, right? Like it, it seems like there's a, a pretty wide range uh, or potentially a wide range of, of application. What's interesting to you in terms of, you know, just from a uh, impact business opportunity, you know, growth opportunity that makes psychedelics, you know, interesting from an investor point of view? Yeah, I think the indications du jour have definitely been mood disorders, mental health disorders. So everything you name, depression, PTSD, anxiety, addiction is another really big vertical. Yeah. Um, and, and psychedelics, there's a variety of compounds depending on the indication that are incredibly effective for that. So, you know, that certainly interests us, but I do think there's a lot of applications that are opening up not to use the panacea argument too much, but there is evidence around neuroregeneration from a lot of these. You do get dendritic spine growth mm -hmm. uh, with neurons. You see neuritogenesis. I mean, a lot of this has been demonstrated. Now, how durable that is, what region of the brain it occurs in, again, jury's still out. So I don't want to overpromise on that. I mean, there's a lot of drugs that are harmful where you see some synaptogenesis for a brief period of time, but I wouldn't recommend people go on a cocaine bender, for example. <laughs> so even though, you know, at a neurological level, you can, you can certainly see similar effects probably in different regions and more oriented around dopamine systems. But, uh -huh. you know, it's so it's it's not it's a very loose argument. But if there's an effect, you know, Eleusis is advancing LSD for early stage Alzheimer's, for example, there could mm -hmm. be promise there. I think another really interesting application is inflammation, like just looking beyond CNS disorders. Inflammation is an area that Chuck Nichols has really pioneered and shown that also just at very low receptor occupancy, you can get pretty remarkable anti-inflammatory effects from psychedelics. And as you start to think of the range of indications that that could cover from IBD to asthma to diabetic retinopathy, yeah. arthritis, the list goes on. Um, there's a lot of potential there. And then pain as well, whether it's neuropathic pain and migraines or cluster headaches, there's a lot of really interesting anecdotes around psilocybin microdosing and LSD microdosing to address cluster headaches um, mm -hmm. or fibromyalgia. Some have been yeah. positing a variety of compounds. So I think there's a lot of promise even beyond just the typical mood disorders that these could address. So we're looking at a variety of indications and a variety of compounds, both within the generic camp and even beyond in what we call NCEs or new chemical entities where they build off psychedelic scaffolds, mm -hmm. but I think improve on a lot of the shortcomings of Gen 1 psychedelics. For example, duration of the trip. We do know there's some very small cardiac liability, only if you're microdosing and it's really with acid in particular. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's shortcomings, I think, to, to overcome, and we will certainly see a Gen 3 emerge over the next decade. Yeah. Yeah. How are you seeing? Because some of these, I mean, we use the term psychedelics to to kind of refer to a whole cluster of things, some of them being, you know, plant-based, some of them animal-based, some of them lab-based. I mean, how do you kind of structure the world in terms of categorizing things or kind of organizing this world of psychedelics? Yeah, we're, we're pretty loose, you know, to keep our mandate broad enough, I'd say, you know, where, where it really started with Palo Santo was, I think, any, any compound that induced some sort of psychoactivity drew derision. And we said, no, what, let's lean into that. Let's lead into these areas where there's stigma because clearly that's getting underpriced, but there still yeah. is value there. So we know ketamine is dissociative. That works on a very different group of receptors, the NMDA receptor relative to a lot of the classic psychedelics known as tryptamines like psilocybin, DMT, you name it, LSD would be, you know, in the lysergamide camp, but still kind of that serotonin type structure. Mm -hmm. Those induce psychoactivity. But beyond that, I mean, we know, for example, Ibogaine, very active at kappa opioid or Amanita muscaria as muscarinic mm -hmm. receptors. I mean, there's a lot of different receptor targets. You can still induce psychoactivity. We are definitely open to that. Now, the purists in the space would say if it is not a serotonin 2A agonist, it is not a psychedelic, yeah. which I think really narrows you in to only one mechanism of action and one we're making a big bet on. Is a fund, we like to have diversification and also you want to have an uncorrelated portfolio. So I will say if you're making a really concentrated bet on one mechanism of action and one that we think is still promising, we think the 2A receptor site has been overlooked but really, really interesting from an efficacy standpoint, you're still taking on a lot of risk. So I do like taking on exposure, whether it's salvia, ibogaine, you know, ketamine, so any sort of NMDA antagonists. We do like to take exposure across a variety of mechanisms, 
just to maintain some lack of correlation in the portfolio and you know, you don't know what you don't know, and, and new data can always emerge out there. Yeah. And, and is that just because where we are as an industry? I mean, in, in three, four, five years, might that strategy change when some of these are better understood and our ability to kind of, you know, engage these receptors in different ways and understanding kind of complexity with the therapeutic process and stuff? I mean, how, how much of this is a function of where we are as an industry versus just good strategy regardless of where you are? I think a lot of it is where we are as an industry. It's kind of not to, not to quote Donald Rumsfeld too much here, but, you know, the <laughs> <laughs> unknown unknowns when you're doing diligence on opportunities that we think, you know, at a very high level, the 5-HT2A receptor site is compelling. But to your point, I mean, downstream from that, there's still a lot we are learning. I mean, you have the receptor. I, I know I'm not on video here, so I'll try to describe it vocally. <laughs> but you have the receptor and then attached to that are G protein or okay. G proteins. And there's different types of G proteins that will decouple depending on the confirmation of the receptor. You also have beta arrest and pathways, which mm -hmm. is a really interesting area that John McCorvey, one of our scientific advisors, also pioneered. I mean, there's just a lot we're still understanding about that. And then downstream from that, we don't fully know what's happening. I mean, you get a whole range of action potentials across neurons where downstream you can get impacts to dopamine systems. I mean, we're still elucidating a lot of that. And so I think there's a lot more to understand, but I could see a world emerge where you could potentially have a 2A agonist, but it's not psychoactive. I mean, the trade-off we've always had to make so far is yeah. that if you're activating the 2A receptor, you're going to probably get an antidepressant effect, but you're also going to you're going to trip balls. Let's just say, yeah. <laughs> let's yeah. call a spade a spade. Yeah. So, you know, can you do we not have to make that Faustian pact? I think we're still figuring that out. I do have hope that there may be a world where that's not the case, though, and you could have much more commercially viable drugs emerge in this space. Yeah. Do you feel, or I'm curious what your assessment of the sort of social history and, and a little bit of the social sigma around, you know, several of these compounds, does that help or hurt the development of these from a kind of pharmacological, like just build, building an industry around these things? Is, is this, is the attention to it, the history of it, people's, you know, kind of, uh, yeah, stigma on it, does that help us or does, does that hurt us? You know, if you'd asked me four years ago, I would have said it definitely hurt us. And, yeah. and we got into this space at a time when it was not cool to talk about at the Thanksgiving dinner table. Yeah. Um, but I've been I've been amazed how quickly the tone has shifted with a lot of people. And I think a lot of that is by virtue of the fact that these have gone a very medical pathway. Mm -hmm. So you have double blind, placebo controlled clinical trials. And it's tough to dispute that. You know, you're using the same endpoints as we've used for SSRIs in many cases, but you're seeing way, way more efficacy. So, I mean, even it's something where now my grandma comes up to me and talks about it. I mean, I've been, even I have been shocked as a proponent of this space, how quickly the tide has shifted yeah. uh, in terms of popular opinion and at least willingness to talk about it. I mean, initially I'll never forget the day I brought this up and I was kind of a old stodgy buttoned up private equity firm and it, you know, suits and ties, no one would ever want to talk about it and tried to bring it up once. And, you know, immediately the door was shut. <laughs> Nowadays people are really, really interested and at yeah. least are going, yeah, this is worth exploring more. I don't know if everyone's there on legalization yet, but, and part of why we like this medical pathway is I think that's how you get your grandmother on board, you know, your, mm -hmm. your aunt, your uncle, you know, people who came out of a generation, the Reagan era, where these were really stigmatized, the data doesn't lie around these. So yeah, it shifted very quickly. Yeah. And where, where do you see the big bottlenecks now? I mean, so we've got some of these trials going, you know, people are developing these therapeutic models, like what's really, I guess, holding, holding progress back or what, what's, what's in the way are the big challenges people are really grappling with at this stage? That's a good question. I mean, a big glaring bottleneck will be clinician training. Now we're a few years off before that really scales up, albeit MAPS is on the horizon with, you know, with their therapy for PTSD, uh -huh. but that will be a big lift is training and scaling up the army of practitioners who are going to be needed to roll out these therapies and oversee psychedelic journeys for millions of patients. So just the, the scale of that, you know, that will definitely emerge, I think, as a really big bottleneck in a lot of ways, you know, maybe if we want to get a little more esoteric, there's probably some bottlenecks around API, like active pharmaceutical ingredient mm -hmm. and sourcing that. I think a lot of people will post their provisional patents or want to use, you know, MDMA for some other creative use case outside of PTSD, but actually getting access to that, finding, finding a CMO 
mm-hmm. that you know has a DEA license, can manufacture that, checks all those boxes, takes a lot longer. And the scale up of that is much more difficult than people think. So I think a lot of these companies, you know, they're, people are putting out press releases, but whether there really is something there and they have an ingredient that they can, you know, they have a, a pharmaceutical product or a formulation they can put in their IND, that, that is not the case for a lot of folks. So I think that's actually more of a bottleneck than people are, are truly aware of in this space. So I'd say though those are a few of them. I mean, certainly infrastructure will be another key one just uh, on top of practitioners, but also clinics, the tech, all of those components that are going to have to overlay these therapies and the data tracking that you're probably going to want to see around patient outcomes. I mean, there's a whole scale up of an inf- infrastructure where it's not just as simple as taking a drug to market and then psychiatrists are prescribing it, you're certainly yeah. going to see a much broader infrastructure emerge around this. So while we are very biotech focused at Palo Santo, um, we'll certainly evaluate other key components of the ecosystem and, and have invested across a wide range of verticals in yeah. the space. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what, you have, what you've invested in, why you've chosen these kind of when generally or specifically, and like what, what's been your kind of thinking or angle around how, uh, how to approach this market at this stage. Yeah. I mean, 80% of our portfolio is biotech in, in full disclosure. And a lot of that is for strategic reasons. A, I don't, you know, a lot of this infrastructure, I don't see emerging without the drugs making it to market first. So we certainly meet with some companies that I think are a little ahead of their time when it comes to tech or clinics and have to wait a few years, whereas biotech is very much in the here and now. So that is that is 80, you know, that's a lot of our portfolio, but we will make some bets where we can see how it plugs into the biotech ecosystem and then we'll really scale up once these commercialize, whether it's a Fluence or a Kasana, which is really focused on patient data capture. But to name a few companies, I think that really excite me. I mean, we're really, we have our eyes set on next gen in a lot of ways. Like I mentioned, there's just a lot of shortcomings of Gen 1 psychedelics. And it's no, dis- I don't mean to disparage psilocybin or LSD mm-hmm. um, or even 5-MeO. I mean, I've, I've had very profound life-shifting experiences with these, but with psilocybin and LSD even, even more so, it's just really long. I mean, to yeah. make that commercially viable is really difficult. And I think you have two camps in this world. One is sort of the storm the gates camp. We have to rethink the whole system, overthrow everything, which I get that. And I very much sympathize with that attitude. I think our healthcare system is broken in a lot of ways and incentives are very misaligned, especially when in cases where healthcare remains fee for service. I still believe in incrementalism though. I mean, these are, this is a pretty big shift and I think we've got to think incrementally in terms of how we roll these therapies out and how we approach that. So we're very much focused on biotech and in particular with next gen, I mean, Delix is one they're working on really non-psychoactive versions of psychedelics. And the claim is you can get some activation at the 2A receptor and get a, a therapeutic benefit out of that. Gilgamesh is certainly working on a range mm-hmm. of NCEs out there. Another one I really like is Tactogen as well. I mean, psilocybin is just really long for a trip. With MDMA, you do get some cardiac liability. You do get quite a bit of norepinephrine release yeah. from standard MDMA, not to mention the come down. I mean, I know there's a lot of back and forth, yeah. and some folks at MAPS will make the claim that there is no come down if you use pure MDMA. That is quite frankly false. I mean, there are reactive metabolites. You get oxygenated free radicals. They Mm -hmm. can kill cells. You don't want to be doing MDMA once a month. I mean, if you're prudent, you should be doing it once every quarter max, or you're taking some serious risks around neurotoxicity. So there's a lot of room for a next generation MDMA that is less euphoric, less abuse potential. And Tactogen is really pioneering the way there. So those are a few examples of companies that excite me that are kind of looking around the corner seeing the shortcomings of Gen 1, you know, finding the aspects we like, and then fixing the obstacles that still are in place around a lot of these and making a lot of improvements to improve access, commercial viability, all those key components that we can get much more mass access to these compounds. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that when you're talking, you know, with the industry a couple of years ago, people wouldn't even entertain the idea of investing in this space. Now, you know, everyone seems or many more people seem at least interested, if not, you know, willing to actually start investing. What have you seen in terms of investor interest, activity? How is that changing the market for folks that are, you know, developing these early stage companies looking for investment? What, what is the dynamic like at this point? Yeah, well, it, it, you bring up an interesting point because a year ago, that was a big question we got from investors was, what is your access to downstream capital? I mean, that is one that's kind of a, a dirty secret within the biotech world is it's yeah. very capital intensive. There's a lot of R&D needs. 
and you combine even all the psychedelic funds out there, I don't think all the, the current psychedelic funds combined could even advance one drug all the way through phase three of development and a commercialization. So there's a much wider pool of capital that is needed out there. So I mean, a lot of us spotted the opportunity early, but you are seeing big players starting to enter the space. I mean, a lot of the life sciences funds are coming in at later stages. Um, 50% of our portfolio, Palo Santo, is preclinical. A lot of the the life sciences folks like an RTW, an RA Capital, a Deerfield, BVF, you name it, they want to play more in the clinical stage. So they'll come in at later stage financings, but have been certainly offering access to downstream capital. I mean, RA Capital participated in Delix's last round, their Series A that was led by Artist Ventures, um, mm-hmm. which is a really, really great tech bio fund out of out of the Bay Area. So you're seeing a lot of activity and certainly acceptance. And even within pharma, I mean, Otsuka took a 7% stake in Compass when they were in their original, I believe, Series B, series A or Series B round. Mm-hmm. Um, they took an active stake. They have a partnership with Mindset Pharma. So you're certainly even seeing big pharma starting to poke around this. And I think you could see big acquisitions down the road in this space at some point. I mean, big pharma has certainly been willing to play in cannabinoid biotech. Uh-huh. GW Pharma was one of the largest exits in cannabis, and that came out of the biotech side of cannabis, not the recreational side. I think that's a you know something not talked about enough. That was a $7.2 billion exit. And then Arena Pharma was acquired by Pfizer, largely for their cannabinoid portfolio. It was something like a $6.7 billion exit. So I know cannabinoids, very different mechanism from psychedelics, but I still think has some bearing on what we could see emerge in the psychedelic space over the next five or 10 years. Yeah. And, and who are you seeing in the companies entering the space? I mean, I imagine that, you know, a lot of traditional kind of pharmacological development has people with extensive pharma- pharmaceutical development backgrounds. It seems like in psychedelics, we're getting, you know, all sorts of characters <laughs> coming out of the woodwork <laughs> that want to create psychedelic companies. I mean, what are you seeing in terms of the people coming, you know, looking looking to raise funds, you know, their their backgrounds, their experiences, why they're doing this? Is there any, any insights that you have there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think initially we were definitely seeing a lot of ex-cannabis, a lot of ex-crypto entering the space. I think with very well-intentioned um, but part of why we launched Palo Santo is I just time and time again, I'd go, you're not asking the right questions. You're not vetting this. And I think it really lent itself to crossover rounds or quick flips and RTOs in Canada, um, mm-hmm. which uh, now is uh, we're seeing that wasn't the best use of capital or the best capital <laughs> yeah. markets path to take by any means. So, you know, a lot of people just weren't getting into the nitty gritty. So that was certainly the first wave. But you are starting to see broader acceptance now, again, whether it's life sciences funds generalist funds entering the space, the capital base has certainly started to change quite a bit and pretty rapidly, I'd say. But yeah, the first wave and, and you know, a lot of what we were working alongside was kind of ex, ex-cannabis, ex-crypto, I think. Some people very well-intentioned. I know a lot of people from the crypto universe see kind of this, you know, these disintermediated networks with like mycelium and there's they're, they're drawing parallels to, to crypto, at least in terms of the ethos. I think Mm -hmm. that's all great. I think in terms of how you vet opportunities, that doesn't really have a lot of bearing. And then cannabis is very, very different. I mean, dispensary focused, grow operations. It's just very different from biotech where you're pre-revenue for seven to 10 years before you even commercialize a product. Um, But that was sort of the first wave. And I think we're certainly seeing it grow. But, you know, we welcome new entrants into the space. I mean, if you let's say there's 20 to 25 indications that psychedelic compounds could address at even a hundred million a pop to get it. And that would be on the low end to get a drug all the way through trials to commercialization. The aggregate capital needs there are 2 billion alone. I think it's going to be much larger than that. So we're going to need a lot of capital entering the space to fund these drugs. So new entrants are welcome. And and I think it's great to see people waking up to the opportunity in this because it's very much needed for downstream capital. Yeah. Anything you're looking at in terms of kind of regulatory legal frameworks? I mean, I I know that cannabis obviously being you know, highly influenced by, you know, the recreational market. I mean, there's been some, uh, you know, a couple of cities, a couple of states that are looking at decriminalizing and making this more available to folks on a non kind of medical level. Do you see that impacting this? Is that just distracting? How do you see the evolution of that impacting the industry? You know, we're, we definitely have our, our eyes on it. We're, we're certainly monitoring it. I'm not, it, I haven't formed a full thesis on where this is going to go for a whole host of reasons, whether it's access, safety, all those factors. I'm not sure if I love it or if it's even the best path to go. I mean, I think running double blind placebo controlled trials is great for validation. It's great for getting these reimbursed 
by payers and that actually increases access that doesn't crimp it in any way. So I we like the biotech model, but this legalization wave could become a reality if more states pursue it. I think the big question for us has been, we don't know how that's going to emerge. Like even if legalization takes hold, what type of business model does it lend to? I don't think we're going to see a dispensary type model yeah. emerge anytime soon. And you know, the legalization that we've seen in Oregon has nothing to do with microdosing. So someone pursuing microdosing applications in Oregon is going to be woefully disappointed. I think you're going to see much more of a clinic type model emerge under an Oregon framework, but clinics aren't great businesses. They don't make a ton of money. That's kind yeah. of the, the dirty little secret around ketamine clinics is they're not incredibly profitable operations. And that's for a one to two hour therapy. You think about a six hour therapy with psilocybin, oh, yeah. that becomes even more difficult for workflow. So, you know, even the viable business models that emerge, I'm not sure if they're great business models or exactly fitting for the VC type of bets that are made. So we're monitoring it. Now, whether it cannibalizes biotech, there's a lot of debate. I think yeah. there's enough pie here and the pie is growing. I honestly don't get that concerned. I think the people who are ardent adopters of these are going to find ways to do them anyway. And what I'm more focused on is the wave of new adopters, you know, your your grandmother or your Aunt Karen, mm -hmm. you know, how do you get people who were baby boomers or Gen X and went through the Reagan era to get comfortable with these? I don't think legalization is going to change that. The biotech model will. And I don't think one necessarily cannibalizes the other. And even as a looser analogy, if you look at the nutraceutical space, I mean, there's certainly examples where nutraceuticals have been turned into FDA approved drugs. They've been more purified. They're more GMP grade. But turn into drugs and, and have been very successful. I mean, Amarin, it, which was advanced by Vicepa, it was a very pure form of fish oil. Um, you know, it did very well, even though there was, there was a competing nutraceutical product. I think there was a lot more value and a premium put on the pharmaceutical. And you think about the sales channel when you're going through doctors, it's prescribed by doctors, it's psychiatrists recommended. It's a very different sales process than, you know, having to capture patients or customers through marketing. So, you know, very long-winded answer because I look at this in a lot of different ways. But A, monitoring it, haven't found a really viable opportunity. And B, I really, I'm not super concerned that one cannibalizes the other. And last mm -hmm. comment I'll make, I think we're going to see a lot of decrim take hold before we see legalization. And decrim won't open up any business model. You won't be able to provide the drug. You can grow your own shrooms. You can ingest them. But there won't be a business model around that to invest in. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, this has been a pleasure. If people want to find out more about you, more about Palo Santo, what's the best way to get that information? Yeah. Well, first off, to give credit to the full team, Palo Santo VC. So it's P-A-L-O-S-A-N-T-O, all one word, dot VC. The full team's on there. Our emails are there. We have a contact us page. Um, if you want to reach out to me in particular, always happy to chat. Um, my email is Tim at Palo Santo VC. As you guys can tell, I love getting wonky, love talking about the space. So I welcome any, any and all conversations from interesting folks out there. Uh, this has been great. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you, Bruce. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to the Psychedelic Invest Podcast. If you liked this episode, please be sure to leave a five-star rating and leave us a review. You can find more episodes on all the major podcasting platforms and our website at psychedelicinvest.com slash podcast. <laughs>